Good afternoon, everyone. My wife, Soprano Helene Williams, and I would like to welcome you to this, our 590th performance together, and my 15th, her 14th, here at Bethpage Library. This, yeah. <laughs> this lecture recital is our ninth this year in memory of my mother, Emily R. Lehrman, who passed away January 13th at the age of 91. There will be three more concerts in her memory. In Freeport, October 18th, Roslyn, November 1st, and Queens College, November 22nd. My mother attended most of our performances here, and we know her spirit is here, along with my father, Nathaniel S. Lehrman, MD. <coughs> Five days after her death, Carol Shapiro emailed us. Emily was a dear person and a good friend. I admired her culture, insight, her great skill as a translator, and was enriched by all the ideas we shared. My mother was, of course, my teacher in the art of translation. And all the translations of the songs Helene will be singing for you today were written by me, some specifically for this program, though a number of them have been circulating since our first Brahms program in 1997, the centennial of his death. And almost every month since then, I get a message from somewhere in the world requesting the right to reprint a translation of mine in a program. Johannes Brahms was and is one of my mother's favorite composers and ours. He was the subject of a wonderful biography, also from 1997. I'll be reading some passages of it to illuminate some of the works we're performing. But first, I'd like to read a bit from the review that I wrote of the book for the German-Jewish publication, Aufbau. In 1967, a gifted young composer and trombonist from Chattanooga, Tennessee, named Jan Johnson, was president of the Harvard Radcliffe Music Club shortly before its demise. Reconciling the desires of a wide public for continual exposure to the mostly 19th century classics with the needs of living composers to write and find an audience for their own works proved too contradictory, and only a couple of years later, the organization burst apart at the seams. 30 years hence, having changed his surname to Swafford, Jan is still dealing with the same contradictions. Endeavoring to pursue a career in composition for which he has won a number of awards, he has nevertheless become much better known as the author of The Vintage Guide to Classical Music and biographies of the American composer Charles Ives, and most recently, the self-styled Hamburg exile in Vienna Johannes Brahms. And this past year, Jan also came out with a book on Beethoven. Ives may have been the forward-looking Washington, Jefferson, and Lincoln of American music, in Leonard Bernstein's often cited words. But Brahms was in many ways the end of a line, the classicist of late Romanticism, who took inspiration from and performed many more of his forebears than his contemporaries, an inclination Swafford seems to share. Quote, I'm not too keen on the state of music in the US these days, and our friends in academe are doing their best to kill it off altogether. In my book, nobody alive is in the league of Stravinsky, Bartok, Schoenberg, Ives at all, unquote. That was a letter that he wrote to me on New Year's Eve, 1996-7. Reviews of his Brahms biography have been, in his own words, quote, all over the map, from masterpiece to borderline pan, unquote. But for our purposes, a few points largely ignored by other critics deserve prominence in particular. How Brahms behaved towards women, Jews, and anti-Semitism. Brahms intentionally destroyed a large amount of his correspondence, along with sketches and even many complete compositions, so we will probably never know the full extent of the romantic relationship he had with Clara Schumann, who, 14 years his senior, was in many ways the love of his life that he frequented whorehouses, claiming to have played the piano in them while still an adolescent, and many times came close to but never consummated a marriage or the composition of an opera is well known. He was an admirer of the militarism of Bismarck, and his triumph lead, now considered an, as inferior as Beethoven's comparable Melodine's victory, was a great contemporaneous success, even with Clara Schumann. Nevertheless, maintains Swafford, quote, he remained a liberal and a democrat at heart, unquote. 
Though an admirer of much of Richard Wagner's music, especially the prelude to Tristan and parts of Meistersinger, Brahms let himself be championed by the Viennese Jewish critic Edward Hanslick as the anti-anti-Semitic alternative to the saint of Bayreuth's and Franz Liszt's music of the future. His friends Theodor Billroth and Victor von Miller zu Eichholz co-founded the Party of Resistance to Anti-Semitism in 1891. And Brahms himself told Richard Heuberger, anti-Semitism is madness. Nonetheless, his own insensitive behavior toward Jews in his circle of friends hardly shows him to have been a model of understanding. His, his needling of Karl Goldmark, composer of the Queen of Sheba, among many other often successful operas, went beyond the bounds of mere teasing. Goldmark had set one of the Psalms to music, using Martin Luther's German translation of the text. Brahms pontificated, don't you think it extraordinary that a Jew should set Martin Luther's words? He said that at, at a dinner with uh, Goldmark at the house of Ignaz Brudel, who was also Jewish, in Vienna, going on relentlessly until, quote, the dinner came to an abrupt end. <laughs> Goldmark soon thereafter moved out of Vienna, which eventually became one of the most reactionary musical centers of all, as well as a hotbed of anti-Semitism. Brahms found himself exalted as the anti-Wagner, and then vilified for his friendship with Jews, like Goldmark and Hanslick. An especially revealing bit of correspondence between Brahms and Bremen music director Karl Reintaler reveals more than almost anything about Brahms' human, even humanistic, a-religiosity, thus at least partially fulfilling his biographer John Swafford's attempt to understand Brahms as a person in the context of his art and age. Urged to make his German requiem more Christian, Brahms responded, as far as the text is concerned, I confess that I would gladly omit even the word German and instead use human. But I had better stop before I say too much. The order of the pieces we're performing for you today is emotional rather than chronological. We begin with four love songs. First, a serenade scene, then a look back at childhood on a text by Brahms' friend Klaus Kolt. Then a message of remembrance conveyed by a breeze. And finally, what Swafford calls the musician's truce with death, a setting of a poem by one of Brahms' mentor Robert Schumann's favorite poets, the romantic ironist Heinrich. <laughs> 